get started with effective solidarity, effective, authentic solidarity for your solidarity outreach plans. All right. So in terms of bridging to the, the amazing panel that just happened, uh, that a lot of those stories we know stir up, a lot of those stories and those facts stir up a lot inside of a lot of us. And hopefully part of what's happened is a feeling of feeling motivated and called to act and fired up. And uh, just we have tools at Move to Amend for to, for you to channel and find your way towards action in your affiliate and in your communities. And so part of what we're gonna be doing, the sound just totally changed. Part of what we're gonna be doing is um, going over some of those tools. Um, so we're gonna start today with um, Mary Sue from Dayton, Ohio. It's great for you to be here. New, so, uh, um, so Mary Sue is from Dayton, Ohio, and she's gonna. We're gonna start with her uh, sharing stories of experiences they've had in their affiliate group of building solidarity in their community, and they've had a lot of really great experiences doing that, really successes. And then we're gonna go into George is gonna lead us through um, through best practices of building solidarity and uh, building power with people in communities, including various sectors that we need to involve to really have genuine representation. Um, we're gonna go over parts of the movement education program. So that's a program that we have, Caitlin talked a bit, a bit about it. We're gonna go over parts of that that are relevant to solidarity and really actualizing a lot of the ideals and goals that were named in the panel just now. And then we're gonna have a big chunk of time for discussion here. So this session is being recorded. It's not being live streamed, but it is being recorded. That's so we are gonna to need to use the mics. And we'll pass them around as people talk. Um, this way, what we learn here together can be useful to other people. Um, who aren't able to be here for one reason or another. So we're gonna have a large chunk of time, uh, the last half of the program here, for discussion here and crowdsourcing. So what are your questions? What are you working on? What are you struggling with with solidarity? And, and work together as a group to find some answers for you to move forward with. So that's our program. Anything else about signing? So we'll turn it over to Mary Sue to hear some of their experience in Dayton. Okay. I, when I came in to move to amend, one of the things that I was most impressed with, or I should say what it most impressed me was that they were calling for a democracy movement. And they said, look around your table, look at your meeting. Does everyone look like you? And if they do, then you're not part of a democracy movement. And so I took that to heart and I said, all right, everybody looked like me and it was a small number. And so how do I expand this vision and really create a democracy movement? At first, I thought that what I wanted to do was to invite people to my table. And fairly quickly, I learned that I needed to go to other people's tables asked to be seated at their table so that I could listen and learn. And I've been doing that for at least five years now in Dayton. I think it's important um, to understand the context of each um, affiliate of each jurisdiction, town, city. So Dayton is 141,000 population, um, but it had been up to 250,000. So um, a lot of jobs lost, a lot of vacant structures, a lot of blight. Uh, one of the organizations that I went to was called Neighborhoods Over Politics, and they're concerned with neighborhood revitalization and um, fighting gentrification. So sitting in with my Move to Amend <laughs> water bottle at every meeting and just introducing myself when we went around the room, you know, I'm Mary Suga Minor with Move to Amend, but not selling move to amend, just listening, learning. And then um, I also went to a group called Racial Justice Now, 
their concern was education. And so to help support them, I got a little more involved with racial justice now. Uh, they had an issue that they wanted to confront the school board about. And so I uh, wrote a statement and spoke out at the school board in support of what Racial Justice Now was doing. And I did mention um, corporate constitutional rights because the charter schools and privatization was very much a part of that issue. So I had an opportunity there to tie things together, but it was a very natural opportunity. It wasn't something that I tried to force in, okay? Another organization, um, well, not so much an organization, but uh, the issue of Standing Rock. Um, got very involved with Standing Rock and helped organize some um, actions around Standing Rock. And again, representing Move to Amend but not selling Move to Amend, when there's an opportunity, we've got our petition, you know, our, our signature sheets out and try to get signatures. But um, they know who I am. They know that this is Move to Amend. They know what Move to Amend stands for now. And most of the people that I work in the community with, you know, have signed the petition. But the emphasis is on collaboration, working together. Uh, Nation of Islam, so Muslims, I've been to Nation of Islam uh, meetings where I was the only white person there. So another part of this is being willing to be uncomfortable, to take risks, to recognize when, um, you know, this is not something I would normally do maybe, but this is what it calls for. So this is what, this is what I do. And I think the most impart, important part of it for all of us is that um, we make the path by walking. We make the path by walking. So you just do it. I make mistakes. I've, I'm sure I've insulted people more than I want to know about, but I do it anyway. You know, I just get out there and make, build these relationships. And I guess that's the other important thing to say is that you're building relationships with the people in these organizations. Uh, and as you learn, you build those relationships. So the relationships became strong enough that when I had moved to amend events, I was able to include them in those events. And the first one of those was in 2014 with David Cobb. And we had a great big celebration, a tent outside, and I had four speakers, local speakers come up and talk about their issues, and then David Cobb spoke and pulled it all together, you know, as, as David Cobb does. And so it, it tied that, it also gave them an opportunity to share their stories. Um, I did a much better event, I think, with George in 2016, I believe. And in that one, we really focused on community. The organizations that I invited to speak all had opportunities to really tell their story and meet with other participants in the room and, and build, what's that? There was cake, yes. Always, always feed people. <laughs> That's very important. But, and then after they were able to talk in smaller groups, then George got up and gave the most beautiful speech on community that I think I've ever heard, seriously. I hope you remember it, George, because it was your best. <laughs> but it really brought people together. And, and again, she included Move to Amend, but that was not the focus, the focus is on the community, the focus is on the democracy movement. And then just last um, April, our barnstorming Jessica Munger came. And uh, one of the, a candidate who had lost for city commission, but was one of the founders of Neighborhoods Over Politics, spoke first, talked about the food desert, talked about the hospital shutting down, talked about uh, the problem of disinvestment in West Dayton, which is our historically black side of town. And then Jessica got up and spoke about how corporate constitutional rights and money and politics get in the way of whatever we're trying to do. So I think the only other things I would say is that I, I keep my guilt and my shame to myself. Um, that, you know, other people don't need to hear that and I don't need to, I mean, I don't feel a need, I guess, to apologize to people or to talk about that. I feel a need to build a relationship that is a going forward relationship. And so I've got showing up for racial justice to deal with the white guilt and shame. And, and that's where I think that belongs. And it requires a lot of humility because we are stepping back. And yeah, I'm used to leading too. That's, you know, that's what I do. So 
this is not leading, this is following. And the, the last thing I want to share is that I do this for me. I am a better person, I'm a happier person, I have a life that is so much richer than it ever was before because of all of the people now that I know and care about. Hang on. Oh, that was really loud. We're going to pass the microphone around. I'll walk it around. We have it's a thumbing. It's thumbing. I should be thumbing. Oh, I don't know about that. Who's going to? Maybe just walk away. <laughs> walk away. Walk away, Tara. <laughs> but did we get your question? Okay, now I do. We have, we have about five minutes okay. uh, where people can ask some questions. So if you raise hands, I'll walk the mic over to you. So. We'll start here and then go over to back. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I just, I felt, I felt when coming here that I needed to build my knowledge base about the movement and about um, everything that we've learned over the last couple of days. And I still feel like I need to learn more and I plan on spending a lot of time reading the literature on the website. That's one of the things that I, yeah. Do you, at any point did you feel, well, I guess I want to know what you did personally to build your knowledge base so that you felt competent to be able to represent us? I still don't feel competent to represent us. I'm sorry, you know, don't wait until you feel competent. Just do it. Just do it. And, and I have no problem apologizing for what I don't know, saying, I'm sorry, I really don't know the answer to that. I really appreciate your question. I wish I could give a better answer and I'll go back and look at it. Can I get your name and your email and let me get back to you about it? I mean, I do that all the time. I also forget people's names a lot. So, you know, what was your name again? I just don't remember. Just do it. <laughs> um, I think um, I'm, I'm not so worried about um, not being able to answer questions as much as I'm worried about people arguing against what we're trying to accomplish and giving an argument that I can't be able to support in, you know, reply to. So I think that's why, no? Okay. George says no. Oh. Oh, sure. I wasn't trying to answer. That was just my body responding. I don't argue with people. If people don't agree, I just say, okay, that's fine. Because they're going to have to come to it in their own place. And you start where people are, and if where they are is in disagreement, then that's where they are. Catch them next week, next month, next year. They'll get there. Or not, which is also fine. Is it my turn now to go? No, you can go You can too. Okay. I'm not trying to rush you. So just wondering if the people around your table at your Move to Amend affiliate still look like you. Yes. Yes, they do. Um, most of the people that I'm working with don't have time to come to my meetings, but they do have time to come to the events. And the, the events definitely are very diverse. So um, my question is, as a working full-time person and also leading up my move to a men group, um, is that's exactly what I wanted to do, but I don't have the time to go to all of these different groups and be a support for my family and all of I just can't. You don't do it. Someone else does it. I've tried. I can't get anyone else to do it. <laughs> Often one of, the, one of the great things about having a demographic that is older and some are retired, some are retired teachers or retired professors, which means they're comfortable talking to people. So you can enlist some of them. If there aren't any around, you gotta find them. You gotta mine for them and find them. Where do they hang out, right? The, you know, um, well we can talk offline about all of the places you might be able to find people. It's a different topic. That's outreach and recruitment. <laughs> So one more question here. Um, this isn't quite a question, but it's sort of a response to what you said. 
Uh, and that is, I mean, what Mary Sue has been talking about is building relationships with people. And you can certainly start that now, even if you don't go and identify yourself as a move to a men person, right? You can just join up with the neighborhoods over politics or whatever, and they'll begin to build a relationship with you before they know you have any kind of association, particularly with move to amend, which is the important thing, right? And then you can begin to talk to them. So just go. This is something I really wanted to do. And, and at the end of the last at the, end, at the end of the last meeting, I really felt lost, like I don't know how to begin. You know, I don't know, I just don't know how to. Anyway, um, I'm wondering if maybe I should go to like a bigger event, like a, instead of like a meeting or a, certain cause, go to a bigger event on a regular basis and then get to know people that way and maybe get invited to participate in a different way. Okay. That she was segueing to this topic now, which is fabulous and graceful. We like that. So I'm going to talk about best practices that I know, and then we're going to generate some among you, because I'm sure you know best practices. Um, one of the reasons I'm really happy Mary Sue said, and the topic wasn't move to amend, and we didn't focus on move to amend, is because doing the work is about building power. And when you build power, it's build power to fill in the blank. I'm really serious about that. Because as we're working to build the movement that it will be required to have a change in the supreme law of the land, if we're going to change the Constitution, we need a movement to do that. It's going to take time and a lot of work, as it has been, and we're doing that work. Along the way, we're going to change school boards and get people elected and get people out of office and create conditions for people to have education and jobs and a host of remedies at your local level. That's why you're building power with the people who are there. So effective ways to do that. Um, from experience, my organizing experience, I know that if you want to win, you have everybody represented in your coalition. That way when you go to the school board, when you go to the city council, they can't say, oh well, this is just a bunch of peaceniks. Oh, this is just a bunch of people of color who are annoyed. Oh, this is just a bunch of Democrats. No, you have everyone. So I have sectors, and I thought about a tenth one that I, is sometimes there or not. So here they, they are. If you have, I, the ideal is to have three individuals from one organization, because you don't want to tokenize people, or you've got at least three different organizations that represent that sector, okay? So peace and justice. When I think of Ohio, I think of Peace Action, I think of the Immigrant Support Network, and I think of the UUs. To me, that would fall under peace and justice, even though the next category is interfaith. The UUs can fall under there too. So peace and justice, interfaith, libertarians or republic and or republicans, Latino, Masa, capital M, capital A, capital S, capital A is Muslim, Arab, and South Asian. Those are not all the same. All South Asians aren't Muslim. Most South Asians are Christians. But that area gets clumped together. And often people who, are, who look Muslim are treated Muslim and have to deal with all of the racism and so you know, they may not want to be Muslim, Arab, and South Asian in one category. I do put folks in one category. African American, student, legal, LGBTQ, and labor. 
where, depending on where you live, labor. If you have all of those sectors represented, you kick ass locally. You're not going to do a whole lot nationally because, you know, they're bought and all. Okay, peace and justice, interfaith, libertarians and republicans, Latino, or people may use different names. My, my list is old, I, as I, I like. Muslim, Arab, and South Asian, African American, student or youth, legal, LGBTQ, and labor. Labor's kind of in parentheses because some places labor doesn't want to be that active. They think it's too political. So your work begin, becomes and you start by finding out what those issues are. You may not, you know, try to do all nine or ten categories at once, but the simple question is, who has the boot on their neck where you live? You know, who's catching hell where you live? Young people, people of color, immigrant folks, Muslim folks. I mean, there is somebody catching hell everywhere, sometimes many people. But that's, you just pay attention to who are those communities, when are they having an event, and you show up. Ideally, you show up early, you help set up. You stay late, you help put stuff away. And you do that again and again and again until somebody comes up to you and say, I've been noticing you come, what you doing? Here? Where are you from? That's when it starts. I think one of the things that was great that um, Gomez, her last name, help me, Jasmine talked about is building that time for trust when she talked about doubling how much time it takes. I don't know if that's accurate. It may be because her experience informs what she says. I do know that you have to build that trust. And it can be hard to build that trust with some communities. Um, I'm not the expert about talking about it since I come from a community that experiences oppression. I often would be the one to say, what do white people do in here? What they want? <laughs> and often that might be how people feel. Um, so you show up early, you stay late, and you, come, you keep coming. You come to public events. It's awesome with an exclamation point that you went to the school board, you wrote a letter, and you spoke for the folks who are getting racial justice. Because when white people do that, that's when folks go, what? Y'all see, did you see that? Y'all hear her? <laughs> and that is excellent. That's how you build credibility within the community. Because there's no reason for somebody to just assume that you're a credible representative of your race or your neighborhood or your community at all if you just show up. Especially in this day and age with surveillance and who are you, you know. I mean, if you showed up at somebody's mosque with the paid agents that are spying on the Muslim community these days, that would be rough indeed. So you are consistent. Your behavior will let people know that you're to be trusted. You're a credible person. Another thing, and I, since I'm taped, I'm a little hesitant about saying this, but one thing that helps to build trust that I do not know, I cannot tell y'all how to do because I'm not, you know, I'm not a white person. Um, is sharing something that lets someone know that you're vulnerable to. I mean, when I walk in a room, people see the color that I'm from. I'm from the South. They make assumptions. I'm larger than average. I'm not all 100% able-bodied. So there's lots of assumptions people make about what might be my areas of oppression. You may or may not be accurate on that. But if I look at an able-bodied young white man, Mr. Will down there, I have no idea of what he's carrying in his life, you know? He may have grown up with as many challenges as I had, and you don't know that. So there are ways, and I've been in settings with people and experienced people who disclose that in a way that helps build that sense of community. Um, you know, someone grew up in a household where the adults put their needs as an adult before the children. Or someone had to deal with um, ongoing poverty or other kinds of loss. And there are ways to say that without telling your business, because you can't be going to people telling all your business. Nobody needs to hear it, and you don't want them to feel like they've got to tell you their business. But there are ways to connect with people, and knowing that when you're connecting with people that don't have rec traditionally recognized areas of privilege, 
and you do, there's a way that you want to be able to say, see, I know this piece of it. You can't say I can relate or I know how you feel. It's a real quick way to get slapped in the face. Not really, but, you know, metaphorically, because I have slapped metaphorically people in the face who said that. Um, but there are ways to disclose that. And I've been in the room, I can't remember any of them where I would tell you the example. But it can be a way to let someone know that, oh, I can connect to that person because there's some place we come together. And that's one of the things you want to make sure you're doing. Am I going through all these, this list? Okay. Um, I know one of the things that was good Mary Sue mentioned is I go to the events and our events now are diverse. And the events are key. Consistency is really important in building relationships and building your coalitions. So you want to have a regular event that either you host or you, I don't know the right word for it, but you know, you're the lead organizer. So ideally, let's say we've got all nine sectors represented. So the peace and justice and interfaith people and libertarians get together and they do the first quarter of the year event. So they've got January, February, March. So in January, February, March, you know, the UUs and the people at the mosque and the libertarian people will get together and put on an event. So they are responsible for that. And everybody on the whole coalition sends their people. And you, the point is just to have a time where you get together, you update each other, you strategize together, you have community and fun, and then you get to go home. But it's also one of the ways that you really build that coalition. Yes, ma'am. You're on my blind side, so. Okay, I was just wondering how regularly the event would look like. Some people have some things every month. I think minimally every quarter. Because you want that regularity and you want to shift the responsibility so that it's not always the same people. You ha if hopefully your coalition's big enough, even if you just have four different organization rights now, each one could lead, take lead on a quarter. And they have to go recruit people from some other organizations to help them put it on. You have a huge event, you have content that's political education, you have community building that's like food and music or dancing or whatever feels good for that community, and you share with each other updates and needs. Here's how we're gonna help each other over the next, the next three months coming up. And then the next quarter you do it again and again, and you know, you celebrate and you're building power together and you're making strategic decisions. We need to go to the hospital to do that. We need to go to down to the factory to do that. We all need to go to the state capitol next month for this. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Political education, content. But that's not the first thing you do. That's in the middle. You want to have some fun in the beginning. Bookend it with community building and fun and talking and noshing and whatever. And then content is the center. And make sure there's space for people to share their updates and ask for what they need from each other. With the expectation that you're coming here, this is the place where you're going to get bodies for your meetings, signatories for your, you know, uh, if you're get going for a grant and you need other people to do letters of support and all that, this is the place you come to get it. And over time, when you build that, the people will start, you'll get more people coming back more often, more organizations wanting to be part of it, because it becomes the place to go and the thing to do and you, you're consciously talking about building power. Sometimes the content in that setting, because you are building power, is doing internal education. Because we do, y'all know this, we've talked about it the last couple days. We, as a culture in the US, do not learn about how to build power with each other, how to hear each other fully, how to listen without judgment and blame and shame, I mean, and that blame, shame stuff is like wedded into some people's DNA, and I hate it for them. But we have to be able to sit with folks who may be really different than us and respect them. And um, coming from a tradition of faith that it's not easy for me because you know, I'm a Leo, but <coughs> sorry, but um, it is really important. And but I think. Being a person of faith helps because you know, you're, you're taught to see the best in people and bow to the divine in you and you'll get the divine from me. That's a great thing to do when you're looking at somebody who's in the Klan. So <laughs> it's important. I mean, you know, because everyone is a human, no matter what spew is coming out of their mouth, they got a heart, 
they have a spirit, we can find a way to connect with them. If not today, then maybe next week, so that we don't have to, you know, think harmful things about them. But inside of our coalition, we want people to feel like, I belong here. When I come here, I feel safe, I am welcome, I am appreciated, I am validated. That means you deal with your gender issues, because we got them. You deal with your race issues. You deal with your class issues, all of the ways that we can be separate, all of the ways that we can hurt each other. But you deal with it in, and I don't, I don't really know what this looks like, Y'all, you decide it with your, at your affiliate or as you're building, you deal with it in ways that are digestible. You don't try to fix it all at one time because it's a lot. I, I meant to find out the book that this quote is from. But I can't remember it, so I'm not going to say it. Cause I, and I'm being recorded, so it's even worse. But it's um, Tony Cade Bombera wrote the book. Tony Cade Bombera. I read it when I was in college. And it's early on, and there's a woman who's going to be healed, or a woman who's a healer, talking to someone who's really sick. And she says to them, are you ready to be healed? Are you sure you're ready to be healed? Because sometimes, if you're not ready to be healed, the healing can kill you. The process of healing can kill you. She doesn't say it quite like that, but that's how I feel when I encounter white folks that want to deal with all of the oppression at one time. Your brain will explode. And you'll wind up thinking, you know, because you've been sold a raw deal and lied to for most of your life, it's, it's a bummer. So taking it in pieces can happen at your meetings too. You can deal with gender at some point and lessons around gender, or even better, better segue, move to a men's movement education program which doesn't in and of itself solve the problems of oppression, but it does help you have a skill set to both understand historically what's happened, why we need a movement, how movements work, what makes them fail, and what skills you'll need to build solidarity with people who don't have the same background as you. So that when you're done and you've got your solidarity plan, you can actually know, oh, here's, here are the groups that I look for, and here's how I approach them, and this is what I do. You also have to do external outreach so that you're trying to get everybody to come and make sure everybody knows they're welcome. Think about where, if you're having regular meetings, where are they? Are they in places that people can walk to? And you remove any barriers to participation. When the young woman um, who's still in high school spoke today and she said, remove from barriers to participate, I went, oh my God, oh my God. Um, especially for somebody in their teens, I was like, wow. She's 40 years younger than me, but she's saying the same stuff I know. I love that. So that means that if transportation is an issue, if childcare is an issue, if food is an issue, you want to make sure that there's not anything that keeps anyone from coming that you want to attend. So think about that. Sometimes it means moving your, the location of your meeting around town. So sometimes it's on the west side, sometimes it's on the east side, sometimes it's in the church, sometimes it's in the library, sometimes it's in someone's house or someone's backyard. But think through that and try to figure it out. And also include in a way regularly in your meetings or your events, something that's uplifting that, not necessarily inspiring, but helps to alleviate the burden that this work can feel like. Because for some of us, it can feel like a burden. For some of it's a life calling or a blessing or whatever, but for some folks it's like, oh, not that again. I don't know, because for me it's not. But I do know for some people, when they think about this work, they go, oh, good Lord, we got to go to that meeting tonight. <laughs> when I was on a finance committee, I felt that way, but I was on the finance committee. But you, you, you had your hand up. Do you have a way? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you can end your meeting with yet a reading from yes. Yes. Hey, that's great. So, did you have a question, sis? Did we get you? I'm talking to you now. You had your hand up. Are you good? Did, you don't have a question? 
Am I done if I talk too long? <laughs> I've covered all the points. Okay, the, m oh, five minutes. The m okay, the MEP solidarity plan, I talked about that, and the template. Um, I did. Man, no, no. That's good. The quote from what? No, the reading. Did you find it? No, I, I can't remember. I was thinking of it when I was doing meditation last night. I have an idea, but I'm not sure. I think it's tar baby, but I'm not sure. Um, okay, listen a lot, talk a little. Offer your resources. Yes, this is the list off of the website, I think, and I wanna make sure I've said everything. Come early, stay late, give rides, bring food. Yes, we covered all of them. Yes, yeah. well, just if people need them, if they're yeah. not in walking distance, you wanna do that. Um, the other thing, and this is something I didn't plan on talking about, so since I have five minutes, I wanna make sure I stick to it. And I'm not gonna remember all of these, but these are the principles of community. So when you're doing community building, and I can email them to people, um, these work. I've used them for all of my organizing life, which is long, um, but it is that you bring your whole self. You know, you don't like, you know, leave that at the door, when I was younger and an organizer in my teens and early 20s, they'd say, you know, that stuff around your class stuff, since I you know, live in poverty, they're like, oh, leave that at the door. So, okay, I could come in, but not the poor part of myself, just the, you know, just the part that can pass for middle class. Okay, fine. So bring your whole self. We're not trying to have people be splintered. We need whole humans. Um, another thing about it, that's, and this is a big one, is stay in it. That means that someone, let's say you go to the meeting and someone says something that annoys you or you feel a little offended and so you ain't gonna go back again. That's not staying in it. And when you're building relationships with people who have differences from you and are dealing with oppression and you don't come back, you've now made it harder for the next person who's white or middle class or educated to come in because you I mean, I heard that a lot growing up. Um, my mom's biggest thing was that white folks are going to destroy the planet and then they're going to go to the moon, live on the moon. It was hilarious as a kid because, you know, and yes, pollution was a problem in the 70s and 80s and, you know, all the stuff, lunar stuff. So the concept that the planet would be ruined and all the white folks would leave, leave and go to the moon because that's what white folks do. When things get rough, they leave you. So as allies, that may have been her experience. So, and but then other people may have that experience. So staying in it means that if and when, and mostly when, because this work, if you choose to say, I care about justice, I'm gonna use all of my intellectual, emotional, and psychological resources to create justice in this country, in the world, that is the rest of your life. Give yourself and everybody else a break. Seriously, relax. Because you can't. we can't do it overnight. We can't do it by next year or even two years from now. It's going to take a minute. So pace yourself. Be loving and forgiving to yourself and others as best you can be. Because I'm not so great on the forgiving tip. But I try. So staying in it means you stay in it. Know that you are absolutely 100% going to screw up. And when you screw up, you go, okay. Let's talk about that, what you got. And staying in it means I hear that and I still respect and love this human. She still respects and loves me. Even if what she said, she's still like, okay, well that still sucks. Okay, because we got to do this. Yes, ma'am, you had your hand up. I can hear you. I don't know if other people can. We, th we, hope, we hope that most volunteers with Move to Amend or affiliate leaders put in at least five hours a week. And on the board, we, do, we, rec we are required to do, I think, 10 hours a month. Is that right? I mean, we clearly do more than that, but we do have a requirement that's on the board. I think, it, I think it's 10 hours a month. So staying in it with people. So that means even when it gets messy, you can't go nowhere. 
You've got to take responsibility for the stuff that you did. Hear people. And part of staying in it is doing your own personal work around all your oppression and your privilege because we all have a privilege. Every single human being has privilege. Yes, Richard. Well, we shared that with affiliate leaders because we think that in five hours a week, you can get done what you need to build an affiliate. Everybody in the affiliate, though, all of, so if you've got five people, five hours a week, you got 20 FTEs at least. Because, you know, volunteers, our pace is a little different sometimes. We do, you know, four hours of work in five hours. That's not the way our math works. So don't hold me to it. This is a long time ago. So staying in it means doing your own work. So for me, it's around young people and people who aren't heterosexual, people who don't, aren't US citizens, you know, people who aren't people of faith, people who can't um, pass for able-bodied, because sometimes I can pass for able-bodied. So I think about how, how does my privilege as a person who went to college get in the way of my building relationships with and building power with people who didn't go to college? And what can I do for people who don't have that same privilege so they see me as an ally and will build power with me? That's my work. It's not theirs to make me comfortable with the fact that they aren't a US citizen and don't speak English. It's my responsibility to make it clear to them how do we connect to each other and build with, with them. So that's part of your work. It's part of staying in it. The other part of staying in it, though, is being accountable for your behavior and your privilege and using it strategically. That's the magic. I haven't said this in a long time. I used to say, and now it's going to be on tape. I'm not going to say this out loud. But there's something about the strategic use of privilege that makes me not think the thought I said to you earlier. It keeps me from saying it, strategic use of privilege, or thinking it in a real way, or having fantasies about people, you know, cut into many pieces. Um, because when you use strategic, your privilege strategically, it's just like magic. Um, it, and that's what you did when you spoke to the board. It means, because we used to do this in our organization. We were mostly women and low in, all low-income people and about half people of color. But there'd be the time we'd look at Jesse and we'd say, Jesse, who's the only male on staff, you put on a suit, you da 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 and you go do that white male thing. And, you know, it was awesome. So, you know, it's great. That strategic use of privilege. And the more we build with Move to Amend, the better we get doing this, the more strategically we're going to have to think about what that looks like. It may mean that if we're dealing with um, homophobia issues and we're talking to the NAACP in Columbus, that I'm the one that talks to them. I'm a woman of faith. I'm a black woman. I absolutely know how to speak as an ally for people who aren't cisgendered and heterosexual. That would be strategic use of my privilege in that case. So that's part of staying in it. We can email you any more about staying in it because I'm sure I've done my five minutes. And now it's time for questions from you all. How do you decide what to do first? Who's getting their ass kicked? It'll be in the paper or on Facebook. I mean, you'll, if you don't know, somebody does. That's it. You identify who's catching hell and how can you help. Where There's going to be a meeting. There's going to be a town hall. There's going to be a church something. And you show up and you just start there. And you find out who's in the room and you make sure you know when the next meeting is and you show up. If you don't really introduce yourself and try to network, in, in my experience, or my recommendation, because in my, my experience is if I go and I know them and they look like me, I talk to them right away. But my recommendation to y'all is to at least go two or three times before you go up to the person running the meeting and say, I'm such and such, and you know, here's what I do. Or ideally, you wait till they come to, to you and say, we noticed you around you were, you were at the march last week. You know, tell us about yourself. 
that cover it? Cool, cool. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, I have a question because the meetings that you're going to and the meetings like you talked about seem like two very different meetings and how do you transition between the two? Or are they not? Well, I, I think George is talking about specific issues that come up, a, a, an emergency or whatever, and I was talking more about ongoing organizations, monthly meetings, that kind of thing. So is that, that's maybe the difference that, that I was hearing. Um, but it's, it's the same thing in that you still want to know which organizations are working towards a particular goal that you, you agree with and you want to you support in some way. So the food desert, you know, is, is a long-term issue. Closing of the hospital is an immediate emergency kind of issue, but the response is still pretty much the same. And the education issue is long-term too, right? Long-term, right. Michael from Ohio. Uh, just going to give an example of, uh, and you said vulnerability. So uh, I didn't participate, but last year at Pride, five people were um, uh, wanting to protest at, five African American people wanted to protest at Pride about the organizers of Pride not paying enough attention to issues around racial um, differences and that kind of thing. And they had a modest protest, they were arrested severely beaten and three of them just got two-year prison sentences and that and there has been a long outpouring of people mostly from surge but I, I don't know mostly that I, I don't know why I said that I shouldn't have said that um, I know this only from email because I feel like I took I, I missed an opportunity these these events would have been the perfect kind of thing that you were talking about here to have been going to, to go to the hearings, to go. Now I'm visiting people in prison, so I'm late, and now trying to show other kind of support way after, and then with the group. But uh, I only mention it just to give an example of this cross-fertilization of an issue. It came up in the news and on Facebook. That's actually Facebook, so I first heard about it, uh, and that, because once the arrest happened, there were really big things happening as we would see it, but the, pre the local press wasn't covering uh, the cases or any of that very much, and, and it really was quite serious, but we know why and all that. But that, I don't know if that helps give an example of a different kind of, the meetings would have, the surge meetings and other meetings and that would have been excellent. And to go to Stonewall, who was the other organization, kind of getting around and hearing all kinds of dialogue. So I'm not gonna make that mistake again. And that somebody was getting her ass kicked and I, I, wasn't, I wasn't there and I wanna be there. Other questions? So um, two questions. One is, I live in a little bubble. It's called Sonoma County. It's in Northern California. And it's um, a wonderful place to live. And th no one's catching hell. It's a, it's, it, I'm surrounded by people like you every day. Um, the, the, it isn't very colorful, that's the only problem. There are, um, there's a Hispanic community, a large Hispanic community. There's a teeny weeny Asian community. There's an even smaller African American community. Um, there is um, an indigenous community, but they're invisible. And um, so the catching hell piece I'm gonna struggle with. So, and I had my second question if I could ask is your, your opinion of surge. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with, I am fairly confident there's a very active surge community there yeah. and some people um, that I may be able to connect you up with who are active that aren't necessarily just surge. So um, I think there's some people doing some good work in that area. Right, woohoo! That's great. <laughs> great. Um, well, I know a, some years ago, I don't know the key leaders in Surge. Um, I know one person who I think of as a fantastic white ally. His name is Chris Crass. And early on, he was connected to Surge. I don't know if he still is at all. He's awesome. 
And like, often in the faith community, you could really love the religion and some of the leaders are not. I was born Catholic. One of my options for retirement may be being in a convent. I would still feel like I pass for Catholic because I, I do all of the religion thing. But the Catholic Church has done some evil shit. I'm not gonna pretend like that's not real. So in that way, I can't say that across the board, Surge is awesome. I know the mission is worthwhile. I hope and trust that the white people involved have some real skills because you can't step to a community and say, oh, we're gonna be your ally and help you out if you got no skills because your basic progressive groovy white person is clueless and does more harm than good. When I said earlier that if you don't know what you're doing, you're gonna get your metaphorically get your face slapped. That has been most of my life with white folks until I made decisions that I would only hang with a certain kind of white folk. Like you gotta be this high to ride this ride. And I'm there now, and if you're not, I don't hang with you. Cause you know, life is short and I got stuff to do. And that's no disrespect to folks that aren't ready. If you're not ready, you can come back when you are. We, got to, we can tell you what the skills are, you just have to learn them. And they're skills, it's not magic. It's mostly good communication. And we said it, listen more than you talk. Show up, be consistent. Show ways that you're vulnerable. Be someone that can be trusted and be authentic. Be real, be flawed, because we are. And when we show those flaws, share those flaws, and try to piece them together, together, then we're stronger. Then we know there's no way I'm turning my back on that person because they mean too much to me. What if no one's catching hell? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay, if not else, think of the neighborhood or the store that is the discount store or the discount grocery store. Go hang out there, you'll see who's catching hell. Or the laundromats, people that don't have washing machines, renters. This was, a, this was a big problem for me when I got started. I didn't know who was catching hell, even in, in Dayton, Ohio, I should have known. But where are the groups who are, you know, I, didn't, I had never heard of neighborhoods over politics, racial justice now, they have very low profiles. And I was fortunate to find one young person um, <clears throat> who was involved in the peace and justice movement and I said to her, I need some help finding anybody that doesn't look like me. And she said, I'll friend you on Facebook. And she did, and she started inviting me to events. So I went to every event that she invited me to for a while. And so peace and justice groups, you might find somebody. And also I had meant to say earlier, I use social media a lot. A lot, a lot happens on social media, and it's also a good way to affirm groups. When you share something that they have posted, they appreciate that. And when you talk about them in, with the public rather than just friends, you're willing to say to the world, I believe in this organization. That goes a long way. There are a lot of organizations. I, I don't want you to think that there aren't. In fact, when we first moved there, there was a whole um, event that was Four, five times the size of this room where all the organizations had tables. So it's, there's organizations up the wazoo. It's just, does, I just have to find out who's catching hell. Okay. <laughs> the organizations could be organizations of comfortable people who are, you know, ladies having lunch and, you know, wine and cheese, which is groovy, but it's not revolutionary. It's not gonna change the fundamental way our country works. Okay, questions, other questions?
or anything that you're struggling with. How about an example of, you know, here's something we tried, here's something we want to do, and ways that we might be able to give you some suggestions to make it better or do it differently next time? Anybody got one of those? I'm Becky from St. Paul. Um, so I guess my question is, um, so we're at the point where we've been going to meetings, we've been engaged with Black Lives Matter and a number of other groups in the, in the Twin Cities area, but we haven't tried to do a combined event. Um, so how did the planning of that go, or how did you get um, in the door to, to cooperate for a combined event? Well, I, we organized them. The, the affiliate organized the event, and we invited people to come and speak from, uh, from those organizations. Everyone loves to speak, to tell their story, to have that platform. <clears throat> so I didn't have any trouble finding people to come. I invite the speaker. They bring their people, and we bring Move to Amend people, and try to bring in other people as well. You know, pass it. Lots, the more organizations, the better, unless you really want to focus on a particular issue and have one organization that's, you know, focused on that issue and tie it into Move to Amend. It is really important when you have all those different folks that come together that you do make the connection to how is this affected by corporate rule. Because otherwise, because it's also an educational event for the people that you've invited. Chances are you haven't had a chance to really talk to them about move to amend and or, you know, they don't necessarily want to take the time to hear you do your spiel on move to amend. But when they come and they talk about schools or hospitals or jobs or education and you make the connection for them, then they may turn around and ask you to come speak at their organizational meeting. And that's a great thing. Um, we've had a couple of speakouts, community speakouts, to which we invited leaders of represent, representatives of four or five nonprofits who deal with homelessness, uh, returning felons, that kind of thing. And we specifically asked, because a lot of people are impacted and their work is impacted and their people are impacted by big money by corporate rule, but they don't even really think of that because they're so busy doing whatever it is they're doing, right? And so we just asked, gave each of them three questions to answer. And the third question was, um, tell us how your work and the people with whom you work are impacted by corporate rule, by big dark money. And so we wanted to sort of help them think of things in that way, in a way that they didn't, because they're so busy doing their own work that they can't think of the underlying cause, which is in common with all of us. And that's always worked really well. We've done it a couple of times. We've invited four speakers, and then they all bring their people. So kind of like what you were doing, Mary Sue. Uh, but we even gave them a little hint. When you speak, we want you to, one of the things you should talk about is how corporate rule affects what you're doing because we just want to get that into people's consciousness. Um, what's the mission of your group? Um, and um, do you work with other groups in the community to fulfill your mission? Um, and then this business about corporate rule. Right. Um, my suggestion for that, addition to that question, is what might you need from the people in this room to work on your mission for, you know, the next six months or this year or whatever? Because, yes, people like to tell their story, but they also want to know, yeah, I'm getting something out of this. It's worth my time to show up to talk to y'all, and I might come back again if I know I might get more people in the room or, you know, folks.
folks showing up at the march, whatever. Um, okay, for uh, Mary Sue and for George both, you've talked about one, having national staff come in and being somebody from the national who goes out to speak. How have you utilized them most effectively and how, what means have you used to really bring out the broader community? I think, well, they were part of the barnstorming tours, which was nice because then the uh, national is doing some of the advertising as well. So we use the usual email blasts and um, press release, media uh, attention that way, Facebook event, try and share that. Uh, and also asking the organizations, you know, to invite people, to bring people in. So we've had relative success, I think, you know. I, my meetings are always pretty small, so these events have been nice in, you know, 100 or so people. Uh, So for us, when we're doing a barnstorming tour, which is great, and you know, have one where you are, so hopefully sometime soon, um, it's about getting, hopefully getting the word out about Move to Amend, letting people know there's a way that they can connect to Move to Amend locally, providing an opportunity for them to meet the affiliate leaders where they are, and hopefully to start volunteering or become active with Move to Amend. And of course, giving them the opportunity to meet us at the national leadership um, team level and make contributions, become a donor. Can't forget that. I also want to mention, we kind of touched on it before, but when you're looking for organizations to connect with, you really want to make sure that you're focusing on organizations that are being led by those people who are being impacted. So, um, the Red Cross is not one of those organizations. You know, they have um, a staff that is dealing with people who are going through disaster. Those people who are on staff are not the disaster sufferers. So Neighborhoods Over Politics is the people who are living in that neighborhood and who are concerned about gentrification and who are concerned about the blight. And so they are the people being impacted and that's why they're an important organization to partner with. My no, surge, surge is made up of people who are not impacted, and their mission is to educate other white people. And they are to, they are to be accountable to black-led organizations. So in Dayton, Surge is accountable to Racial Justice Now. Um, we're beginning to partner with a group called Ohio Families Unite Against Police Brutality, which was started by a woman whose son was killed by police in Moraine. Um, we have plenty of police killings in Ohio. There's plenty of mothers there that are in a lot of pain and they've put an organization together. So Surge is checking in with them on a regular basis about what we're doing. Um, but our mission, you know, is really like white anti-racism training, bystander training. So we have that. We have fundraisers for those black-led organizations, um, immigrant organizations, that sort of thing. Does that make sense? Okay, good. We're almost done. I want to um, encourage you to think about any questions that you have or any scenarios that you uh, imagine might happen that we can help problem solve. Um, I want to share with you an, a workshop exercise that maybe we should have done, but I think about it in terms of our issues as well. It's an exercise that and we can email this if we want to, although I don't know if people want to do it. It's not, it's not a lot of fun. It's, um, being honest, it's an exercise that helps to demonstrate the difference between oppression and personal pain. It's an exercise I came up with because I got tired of white people telling me that they knew how I felt. Because there is a difference. And when it comes to the issues that we're dealing with, I think that there's a, a relationship in terms of the personal pain that we're dealing with, with shootings and climate change and economic stability and education costs and the oppression of corporate rule. So 
It's called bubbles and bricks, this exercise. So what you do, and I recommend that folks do it on a regular basis, like every month or so, because there's a point in doing the exercise of helping you to get to a place where things are not so injurious. So in bubbles and bricks, it's, it's a written exercise, so it's all intellectual, it's not meant to be triggering emotionally, and it doesn't have to be, and it's very effective, because I designed it. So, what you do is you consider an incident that was horrible for you, totally sucked. It could be something that happened last week or 50 years ago, and you write down the incident. Uh, you know, some kid on a bus threw something at me and called me a nigger. You write it down. Kid on a bus, da, da, da. And then you think about what was that oppression? Was it personal pain? Was it both? Because some things are both. Um, it's oppression to grow up in poverty because classism is a thing and it's, it's an oppression of classism. But some of us grow up and we get jobs that pay good wages and we can live in a neighborhood that's really different and drive a car that's really different and have a savings account and an IRA. So that condition is different. So it's, you know, there's some personal pain and oppression, it's both. Growing up in a household where you've got a parent who's alcoholic and every time they get drunk they beat you up, that's oppression and personal pain because you're younger than them and they have power over you. Oppression's about power. If there's a power dynamic, oppression is present. And of course the personal pain of, you know, your kid, your parents, abusive, all that crap. Okay. So you write this thing down and you say what you think it is and then, here's the real key though, how, do you store, how did you store that memory? Now we don't often think about how we store memories, but we do store them. I'm not a psychologist, I, didn't, I don't have a PhD or a master's, this is just how I came up with the exercise. So, if when you think about it, if when you think about the memory, yeah, it feels heavy. You know, you, sometimes your shoulders will even drop when you think about it. It's like, oh, it's heavy. That is often an indicator of a brick. It weighs you down, you feel it. And sometimes when something's a brick, you can even use that same kind of negative energy against someone else. Someone called me a name, so I'm going to call somebody else a name. And so you hurl that brick, but it's still a brick, you're still carrying it, you're still, every time you think about it, you still get weighted down, so that's a brick, so you write down as brick. All bricks are almost always oppression. Okay, so another way people stir, uh, store memories is like when you think about the memory, if it's really vivid and it's like right in your face, it almost takes your breath away. You know, you're like, oh, you kind of catch something maybe in your throat. That often is oppression and personal pain and very often is connected to physical or sexual abuse. Just saying. So that's a scent. So that uh, bricks are heavy, they weigh you down, scent is like, oh. Here's the memory in your face, and then it's gone really quick. Like somebody opened the window and it flew out. That is a scent. Another way you might um, share a memory is if when you think about the memory, it, it was something that sucked. It was really bad, but it's also oh, important to you in a way. In some way, it's kind of how it helped, it helped you grow in a certain way, or you, it's one of the ways you define yourself, so you, you kind of protect it like you would an egg. You might show it to someone, but you, and it's near your heart. It's like when you think about it, it's like here. It's like, yeah, that totally sucked, but that was, I endured it and I am better for it. That's an egg. So we've got bricks, we've got scents, we've got eggs. Another way you can uh, store a memory is you think about it and it's outside of yourself. You see it. It's right there, you think about it, and then boop, it's gone, like a bubble. So there's bricks, scents, eggs, and bubbles. That's the way we store stuff. Bricks and scents are almost always oppression. Eggs are sometimes oppression too, sometimes not. Bubbles are definitely personal pain only. And we want to get to the place where most memories are bubbles. So that's why I say you do it on a regular basis, and because you can move something that's a brick to be a bubble. I've done that with one memory and it's awesome that I can think of now this complete bubble that used to be a big brick. So 
That's, and then after you've looked at it, you see where they are, and your work then becomes, okay, let's try to work on this. What can I do to get this particular place not so it weighs me down every time I think about it, and I might use it as a weapon against anyone else. One, uh, so that's one benefit of the exercise. The other one is that personal pain is finite. It's going to end. If you grew up in a house with someone who's abusive, you can send them to prison, you can kill them, they can die. It's finite, it's gonna end. Same thing if you have a partner or a spouse who's abusive. You can divorce them, you can send them to prison, you can kill them, they can die. It is finite. So personal pain is finite, it's not for the rest of your life. Oppression is chronic. Every day, all day, until you die, that oppression is there. It's not gonna go away. Although, personal pain, while finite, you can also end by yourself or with one or two other people. You call the cops, you tell your parents, you tell a priest or a preacher if the priest is shady. It ends. I know for myself, childhood sexual abuse ended when I told someone. It didn't take a movement. A couple of people, it's over. Oppression only ends with a movement. You cannot end oppression by yourself. But together with other people, you can end oppression. So the, the correlation between that exercise, which is a great exercise to do as part of racial justice training, because groovy white folks, while clueless, are also very deeply empathetic. And they do want to say, I know how you feel. But those of us who've been through it, you better shut up. So, the exercise is a better way than me saying something harsh, harsh to people. That's why I came up with it. I think it's effective. Also, though, those of us who are dealing with police killings and Hawaii turning into God knows what because of climate change and what's going on in Puerto Rico and what's going on with our military, it's too much. And we can't end it by ourselves because it's rooted in corporate rule. It can only stop, like oppression, with a movement. And we are the people to do it, and now is the time to do it. It's a lot of work. It's worth every bit of it. Thank you for the work that you're doing. We're here with you. Thank you. We'll make it happen. Yay, us! Woo!